the line in the sand. You're here off screen, you're over here, and the rest of the population is here. But if you consider this to be perfectly healthy in my right hand, there's a huge spectrum of people who are on the way to developing celiac. I call them CITs, celiacs in training. No longer counselors, you're celiacs in training. So you're on the way to disease. You might never get there, but it can influence your absorption, your nutrient status, and 40% and of the population has one or both of the genes for celiac. So it's very common to be reactive to gluten without being celiac because, you know, God willing, you're never going to get to the end result, which is to develop the autoimmune portion. So I think it's important to remember that you don't have to have celiac to have the problems of it developing be long before. If you haven't done so already, go ahead and click that subscribe button down below. It's a little red button. You punch that and it's going to notify you every time we put out a new episode that can help you improve your bone health. And then also, if you haven't done so already, head over to bonecoach.com, sign up for the free seven day osteoporosis kickstart. That's going to walk you through everything you need to be doing right now to get on the path to improvement and stronger bones. After you do those two things, go ahead and press play on this episode and I'll see you inside. Welcome, welcome to this episode of The Bone Coach Show. Joining us today to explore protect your bones, get rid of your toxins is Dr. Wendy Trubeau. Wendy Trubeau, MD, uh, is a functional medicine practitioner, is passionate about helping women optimize their health and lives as a functional medicine gynecologist. Through her struggles with mold and metal toxicity, celiac disease, and other health issues, Trubeau has developed a deep sense of compassion and expertise for what her patients are facing. She's the co-author of Dirty Girl, Ditch the Toxins, Look Great, and feel freaking amazing. Uh, Wendy, thanks so much for being here. It's a pleasure to have you. My pleasure, Kevin. Great to be here. I hope today's valuable for people. You know, let's like give them tips and tricks. Yes. Yes. That's what I want. And I, well, before we get into that, I want to start with your story because you've had quite the story and the journey before you got into helping uh, all these other people that you've helped. So please share a little bit about uh, your health journey too. Sure. Uh, someone once said to me, your mess became your message. I said, oh my gosh, yes, my mess became my message. So my story is like a camel's back, meaning it has two major humps. Leading up to the first one is the fact that of the worst genetics. So I have two copies for celiac disease, the genetic mutations for celiac. I have two copies for MTHFR. I have two copies for vitamin D deficiency. So I didn't enter the world with like the best genetics. I'm an Ashkenazic Jew. We're completely inbred. So I have the worst of everything. So let's just set the stage. I enter the world and within six months, I have pneumonia. I got antibiotics. My whole childhood was characterized by ear infections, strep throat, ear infections, strep throat. It's just like never ending cycle. And we didn't know in the 70s, or I didn't know, and my parents didn't know that that was really a harbinger of food sensitivities. So we just kept eating sloppy joes and my mom cooked everything, but it was still, you know, not the best. Fast forward to my teenage years, I had terrible, terrible iron deficiency anemia. It Nothing worked. Taking iron, and they didn't do iron infusions for people like me at that point, because they're like, you're alive, you're fine, you're not a cancer patient. So they just said, take iron more. And I was like, I'm never going to poop again. But I actually took it and it didn't make a difference. Fast forward to my 20s, when I have what looking back, I would call room clearing gas. Like I cannot believe I actually got married because it was awful. And I just figured everyone had a better cork than I did. So I suffered with it. I was like, I don't know what the problem is, but everything irritated my stomach. And then fast forward to I'm through med school. I've gotten married. God love my husband. I've had my first child. I'm on my way to my second child. And literally I can barely get out of bed. I get out of bed because I am the primary breadwinner in our family at this point. And if I don't go to work, we don't have a house. So I go to work every day, but I'm sick head to toe, brain fog, hair loss, anxiety. I'm pretty high strung, but I'm not anxious. If that makes any sense. I'm just, I have a lot of energy. I had thyroid issues. I had asthma heart palpitations, night sweats, wasting. I was deficient in everything, not just iron this time. I had bloating, gas, diarrhea, constipation, sometimes all on the same day, right? Like just you name it. And I would kind of cycle through it. My bones hurt. I had infertility, which I made up for. I have four kids now. And I just generally felt terrible. And my husband was mentoring with one of the functional medicine doctors in Boston. And he said, well, look, before our good insurance changes, why don't you go have a consult with him? I was like, sure, whatever. 
I don't care. I like, I'll do anything at this point. Cause I felt so terrible. So he does the million dollar workup, which was like 4,000. But at the time I, I thought, wow, that's huge. And we're in the car on the way up to see him. So we're on the way to the follow-up appointment. And I said, and we have a six week old in the back who's screaming because she hates the bucket seat. And I said to Ed, call him and find out what's wrong. And it's like, we're going to be there in 15 minutes. And I said, you have to call him. Now I was postpartum and nursing and not sleeping on top of not feeling well. So I was a little bit irrational. And so being a kind man, he calls his, his mentor and he says, I'm really sorry to bug you, but Wendy's like freaking out next to me. Is there something really majorly wrong? And I pipe up, do I have diabetes? And he says, the doctor on the other line says, you don't have diabetes, you have celiac. And I said, oh, my dad has celiac. And he responded, it's genetic. You probably should have been tested. And I was like, oh, well, I didn't learn that in med school. I actually didn't know that it was genetic. So I was 35. That's the first major camel hump after, although it's like a slow crescendo because I had been sick since I was 15 and I never complained. And I just pushed through because that's what I thought you had to do. And I didn't want to be labeled as crazy. So I fell through the cracks. Um, I had, you know, anemia, nutritional deficiencies. I did do a bone density test when I got the diagnosis and it was normal, which I was shocked by. So that's hump one. Let me pause there because a lot of people are like, I have a question. Do you have any questions? No, I mean, this is, I think a lot of what you're saying too is relatable for people also. Mm -hmm. I mean, when you're, when you're struggling with all these different things and you just, you don't know how, you don't know how to address any of them. And you're just pulling like, please, somebody help me. And then you finally find somebody that is starting to give you some clues. And then you get to the point where you can start moving in the right, right direction and, and gaining momentum toward better health. And I think that's what you're getting ready to share right now is how you got to that yeah. point. Yeah. And the thing that I'll highlight there is one thing that's so important for people to recognize is that terrible health or great health don't develop overnight unless you have some majorly traumatic event. And so for me, when I looked back, I could see the slow degeneration in my health, but living it was just the way I felt. And it, it was only when I, I got to that, what I'll call bad enough state that I could go, I'm really not well. And so I think a lot of us live like it's not bad enough and we don't want to be labeled crazy and we don't want to be the complainers. And most of the doctors are like, I can't do anything for you anyway. So it was only through functional medicine that I discovered how to actually get healthy. So that's hump one. Diagnosis of celiac. I learn about functional medicine. It causes me to change my whole career. I was an OBGYN. I delivered babies. I did surgery. I did office care. I did all that stuff. And then I learn about this other wing of medicine. So uh, we, in, in 2008, I basically quit my paid, my well-paid job for my unpaid job, at, which was volunteering in, in our first company to make sure the phones were answered and we grew properly. And the next day I found out I was pregnant and I was like, what have I done? <laughs> what have I done? I'm leaving my paid job. They were going to put me on maternity leave at like 24 weeks. Cause of course having celiac, I had bad pregnancies. It's a risk factor. So I was like, oh my God, oh my God, what have I done? And Ed's like, it'll be fine. I was like, should I rescind my 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 resignation? He goes, no, no, it's killing you. Okay. So I get out of OB, I go into functional medicine. And then fast forward to perimenopause, which I must say is cruel and unusual punishment for any woman. I, I feel like it's it's like some kind of revenge. And we go to Paris, which is like the trip of a lifetime. I'm with, my kids are still talking about the restaurants we ate in, in Paris, so that were gluten-free. So we come home from Paris and my hair starts falling out, like, like just shedding. And I gain nine pounds after the trip, not on the trip, after the trip. And I have a rash on my face that I, I wanted to rip my face off every day. And I'm in functional medicine at this point. So I'm First, I'm like, what does every woman think when she gains weight? It's her thyroid. So I check my thyroid. It's perfect. I check my hormones. They're pretty good. I check my gut. It's never been better. Now I'm totally stumped because I'm like, I don't know what's going on. And I happened to hear a report about three months after coming home that said that when Notre Dame burned, it released 500 tons of lead 
dust into the air. And the closer one was to the epicenter of the blaze, the, the more exposure one got. And the farther away one was, the less one got, which makes sense. And you're looking at me like, why are you telling me this? And I'm telling you this because the week I went on vacation was the week after Notre Dame burned. And we slogged through inches of dust. And I, I said to Ed, my shoes are ruined. It's so dusty here. What I didn't realize is I got a lead exposure and it was enough to tip me over the edge. So I did a lead test and found that it was 25% higher than it had been. It had been mildly positive and like a bad patient, I ignored the mild positive, not recognizing at that time that that, that mild positive was really the tip of the iceberg. It wasn't mild positive. It's just what I was able to show. Remember the MTHFR, crappy detoxing. So I did all the testing and I did testing for heavy metals and found that I had lead and mercury at toxic levels. I had four strains of mycotoxins, five strains actually, which are the toxins that happen when you get exposed to toxic mold in me. And I had a whole slew of other environmental toxins like nail polish, the, the toxins in nail polish, the toxins in, in makeup, dry cleaning, flame retardants. And I looked at Ed and I said, so by this point, you know, it's been going on for months and I am an unhappy puppy. And I looked at him and I said, I am such a dirty girl. And that's why we wrote the book, because I have been living this healthy life with organic food. We cook everything ourselves. We don't really eat out because my celiac is so sensitive. So if I have all these toxins and I'm leading the healthy lifestyle, what does everyone else have who's not doing this and not as into it? And how can we prevent others from having what I had? Because I wouldn't wish that on anyone. So I've spent the last, that was four years ago, I've spent four years peeling back the toxins and peeling back the, the metals, and I'm still getting rid of them, if you can believe it. It's been three and a half years that I've been on the treatment for metals. I'm still getting rid of my metals. It's, 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 like, it's like cleaning a wall that has a million holes in it with a tweezer. That's how it is. So I think it's apropos because there's so many points in the story. Having celiac puts you at risk for osteoporosis and bone loss. Having heavy metals, particularly, well, I won't, I won't spoil the punchline. Having heavy metals can put you at risk for bone loss. And I think what we should talk, I mean, I think today we're going to talk about all those ways that we can prevent it, reverse it, and, and really feel freaking amazing because that's the goal, right? And that be safe the, and vital. That is the goal. And, and I, you said something before we got on and, and started the interview, she was, uh, Wendy was so great about coming up with these, you know, short titles and things like that. For She said, toxins love your bones, but they don't love your bones back. Um, and, or yeah. And, and I think that's so important for us to, to understand too, that even after you identify that you have these issues, it's not a quick fix. You mentioned that years ago, you found out you had issues with metals and now you're still working through clearing those. Uh, mm -hmm. and getting those out. So, and then celiac disease, you and I have talked about this before. We've been out to dinner together, uh, in different places. And, um, it's, it's a challenge sometimes when you have celiac disease to go out and have a good quality meal somewhere and to sit down and enjoy it. Um, and sometimes it, that requires a little more planning on your part as the individual of figuring out where you're going to dine or maybe yeah. bringing your own food or maybe preparing your own food and eating before you go out. I do that all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, if I if I don't feel comfortable with where we're going, yeah. um, I will have already gone to Whole Foods or some organic natural store and put together a meal that I think I'm going to enjoy. And I'll eat that before I even go out. And you got any tips there for somebody with celiac disease where... Um, you know, they may be planning to go enjoy a meal with people, but they're not sure it's safe. Yeah, I have tons of tips because, I mean, you sat with me as I haul out my own food just to share. We go to hotels and we travel with a an induction cooktop and cookware. Um, now, I will say, Kevin, that uh, I had a breakthrough the week after or two weeks after I saw you. I actually ate out last two weeks ago and I wasn't sick. Love which it. was, and it wasn't a dedicated gluten-free place, but it is a place that is very focused on doing gluten-free well. So normally I'm, I'm 
too untrusting of a place. And I, I value highly functioning too much to have a setback because it messes with my brain and my gut and I can't cope with not being able to think. So here are the tips. One, life is uncertain. Always eat first. You know, two, never show up ever, never show up at someone's house without telling them that you're gluten-free. I, I want to, okay, I'm gluten-free. So my house is always gluten-free, but I will accommodate any food request sensitivity or preference if I know about it. So if you're a vegan, I will feed you. Okay. I just need to know. But if you show up and you're a vegan and you didn't tell me, I might not be prepared for you. Right. So always communicate. Communication is essential. Offer to bring something, especially if you're going to someone's house for dinner. Oh, can I bring something? That way you'll know you have something that is safe. If it turns out that people have contaminated your food. I remember one of my relatives took the butter, you know, this is stuff you think about, took the butter, which is fine, but then smeared it on his bread. His bread wasn't gluten-free and then put the knife back in the butter. And I was like, well, you just contaminated the butter and the knife. And now I can't eat the butter. So communicate with people, tell them what that means, offer to bring things, bring a buddy. My husband is my buddy. I might be a little lenient and say, oh, I'll try it. And he's like, no, no. So bring someone who can advocate on your behalf, who's not, unco- who's comfortable being the bad guy. I don't want to be the bad guy, but I will be. I'll just say, I'm sorry, I'm not hungry, or I'm sorry, I can't eat that, or um, I have celiac, so I don't want to feel sick if I eat that. But it can be uncomfortable, you know, especially around holidays when people say, it's just a little bit. And I'm like, well, it's, you know, I get really sick from it. So the best thing I ever learned to say, and I'll offer to all of your listeners is, that doesn't work for me. Nobody can argue with that. Mm-hmm. I use it liberally in my, with my kids too. I have all these children and they're like, let's do this and let's do that. And I'm like, that doesn't work for me. You're not nasty. You're just saying that doesn't work for me. Nice big smile. So practice in the mirror saying that doesn't work for me. Thank you. I'm going to bring my own food or I ate already, or um, I brought something. So be comfortable with the boundary because you deserve to feel good. And there's no reason for you not to feel good and eat something that doesn't work for you. It's not about cheating. It's about what loves you back. If it doesn't love you back, don't eat it. I love those tips. And for those of you that are listening to this, maybe you're not, you don't have celiac disease, but maybe you know somebody who is gluten-free or has celiac disease. Uh, Wendy and I both have celiac disease, so we can speak from experience and being the person in that position But I can tell you the reason why this is so important is that number one, if you're ingesting gluten or proteins that mimic gluten, they can damage the villi and the small intestine that can, you know, blunt your villi, prevent you from absorbing nutrients. And then eventually your body's going to pull those nutrients from the largest mineral reserve it has, which is your bones. And that can contribute to bone loss and osteoporosis, but not just that it can contribute to, you know, if you get, we call it glutened. When you, you know, when you eat some gluten, we call it gluten and even it's, it can even be a crumb or a little bit more than a crumb even. Uh, and that's why celiac disease is so important. It can cause that damage, but I've had situations where I've been glutened and it has put me out for three to five days where I'm just kind of, you know, my energy level is just completely shut down. My whole body aches, uh, like I've kind of been beat up a little bit. And uh, it can take you quite a bit of time to recover from something like that. So it's not always like a digestive issue that you would have following being gluten. And that's why I would just say you don't need to maybe like isolate somebody that has gluten or has celiac disease or has to be gluten free at a party and like ask them a ton of questions, but maybe just take that into consideration that um, it's they can't just try it. Uh, Because they could actually be legitimately sick and in pain and have an autoimmune response to it for a long period of time after. Um, So I think that's good on the celiac disease. Any other notes you want to make on that before we go to the next thing? Yeah. So this is this is sort of tangential to that. I think it's important to talk about you can have gluten sensitivity without being celiac and it can mess you up because celiac is where they test you and they do the endoscopy and they do the blood work and they go, yep, you've crossed the line in the sand. You're here off screen, you're over here and the rest of the population is here. But if you consider this to be perfectly healthy in my right hand, there's a huge spectrum of people who are on the way to developing celiac. I call them CITs, celiacs in training, no longer counselors, your celiacs in training. 
So you're on the way to disease. You might never get there, but it can influence your absorption, your nutrient status. And and 40% of the population has one or both of the genes for celiac. So it's very common to be reactive to gluten without being celiac because, you know, God willing, you're never going to get to the end result, which is to develop the autoimmune portion. So I think it's important to remember that you don't have to have celiac to have the problems of it developing bef- long before. Yeah. Yeah. I totally agree with that. Now, I know we've talked about other toxins. I mean, you, you've dealt with a lot of other health issues and toxins and things like that. Well, let's talk about why are toxins such a problem? Okay. So one, they're really bad for you. <laughs> okay. End of podcast, right? No, they're really bad for you and they're everywhere. So you can't get rid of, you can't, being toxin free is a fallacy. You're never going to be toxin free. What you're looking for is how do you minimize your exposure so that your body can excrete the rest. But we're exposed to more toxins in a day than our ancestors were exposed to in a year. So the we're being literally bombarded. So when I say toxins, I mean anything that the body has to struggle to excrete. So let's go through your morning. Your shampoo can have phthalates in it. These are endocrine disrupting hormones. Your body products can have heavy metals in them. Your nail polish can have toxins in them that throw off your system. Your bed can have flame retardants that are endocrine disruptors. Endocrine disruptors mess up your adrenals, your thyroid, and your hormones. That matters because if you have if you have osteoporosis, you can have issues with osteoporosis because your hormones are low. So it can throw off your hormones. Your hormones can be a toxin because your body has to excrete them. If you go down pathways that are unhealthy, you're more at risk for developing estrogen dominance, which leads to fibroids and estrogen dependent cancers. Nobody wants that. Other toxins, paint, construction materials, gasoline fumes, you name it, it's got toxins in it, plastics. So they're everywhere. Uh, There was a recent article in the New York Times about a guy who tried to live a day without plastic and he couldn't do very many things. Uh, He tried not to eat food that was in plastic, except every piece of food that you eat has a little piece of plastic on it. So he counted like 200 violations during his day when he tried to wend through the day and he brought his stool onto the, the train. He wore a hand knitted wool sweatshirt sweater that his wife had been given. So it's almost impossible to avoid plastics and other toxins throughout the course of our day. So it's not about being free, it's about minimizing. So the impact they have on us goes head to toe. Toxins can have you lose your hair, mess up your thyroid, mess with your risk of heart disease, alter your brain function, put you at higher risk for Alzheimer's, dementia, Parkinson's, multiple sclerosis, other autoimmune disease, celiac disease, you name it, being exposed to toxins is implicated. And I don't want to forget to talk about diabetes and metabolic syndrome because the imbalances caused by toxins directly lead to people's inability to properly balance their sugar leading to diabetes over time. So it's it's endless. Goes on yeah. and on. Yeah. And are there specifically for our bone health, are there toxins that are impacting our bones as well? Yes, sir. There are. So I'm glad we didn't spoil the spoil it beforehand. Uh, lead in particular loves your bones, loves it. Like no question, no holds barred, lead gets stored in your bones. So anyone who's, uh, well, born before 1978, let's just put it that way. If you were born before 1978, you had paint that had contained lead. So any home, if you live in it and it was built before 1978 and not gut renovated, you're being exposed to lead ongoingly because obviously you're restraining yourself from licking the licking the windowsills and licking, you know, you're not doing that. However, as the house settles and every day it settles, the joists where the ceiling meets the walls, where the malls meet the floor, where the walls meet each other, they grind a little bit. And there's this very small amount of dust and the dust has lead in it. You walk on it, you breathe it in, you eat it, you absorb it. So you get that lead ongoingly. That's one way. Another major way, you're human and you were born to someone and your mother gave you 50% of her heavy metals which means that if your mom 
had lead or mercury or mercury fillings, you got 50% of her body burden and you pass 50% of your body burden onto your children when you bear children. So that's why successively my kids are healthier down the row. You know, the last one is healthier than the first one because she got the biggest burden of my, of my toxins and I had undiagnosed celiac and she was a preemie as a result. So it's a bad combination. So going back to things for lead, women who were born and lived in the, I'm trying to remember when they outlawed leaded gasoline, but it was sometime in the sixties or seventies, I believe. So if you were living then you were exposed to lead in the gasoline. And then there's a lot of industrial processes that still expose us. So there's, there's ways that we get exposed. People love to do weekend DIY projects on their old homes and they're getting a lead exposure. So there's a lot of ways that we get exposed that are sort of unconscious. Yeah. And, and these heavy metals too. I mean, <clears throat> are there other toxins outside of just the heavy metals also? I know you talked about phthalates and some other things too. What, what are some of the other big ones that you can think about? So in terms of, I mean, there's so many, the, the lead preferentially goes to the bones typically, and the, the mercury is going to your, your, not as much your bones, but more your organs uh, and your fat and your brain. Mm -hmm. The, the, most of the toxins are stored in our fat, which is why it's so hard. F okay, Kevin, I'm going to be real for a second. You don't have any problems losing weight, but for the women in the room, hypothetically speaking, when we hit certain ages, it is hard to take that weight off and we start to develop muffin tops and pooches. And we're like, where'd that come from? I didn't have that yesterday. How do I have it today? So those types of things can be difficult to lose because they're storing fat. I'm sorry, they're storing toxins. And you can't get rid of the fat until you get rid of the toxins from them. Here's the thing we haven't talked about, alcohol. I'm sure you've covered alcohol and risk of osteoporosis on other podcasts, but alcohol is a toxin. So I was talking to a patient of mine yesterday who said to me, she just did a dry month. And I was like, that's so great. Congratulations. And we were talking about how if someone said to you, here is a cup of toxins, it's going to make it harder for your liver to deal with the other stuff it's it's given. It's going to make you not think clearly and it'll make you feel horrible tomorrow. Would you like some? You would be like, absolutely not. But somehow we've normalized that it's good to drink alcohol and you're cool if you drink alcohol. But it's bad for your bones and it's a toxin and it makes it harder for your liver to deal with the other toxins it's getting bombarded with. So it raises your body's burden overall and makes it harder for you to detox. Now, yeah, is it, it, anyone still listening even? Like, no, oh yeah, no, this is, um, and I know that's hard for some people to hear too, uh, at, that alcohol is a toxin and it's, you know, I remember for me, I used to drink a lot, a lot of alcohol when I was in the Marine Corps. Uh, I, and especially right after I got out of the Marine Corps, I drank alcohol almost every single day. Sometimes it was with the purpose of just, you know, uh, I used it as a tool at that point in time. Mm -hmm. Uh, but I am, I no longer drink alcohol. Uh, and if I do, it will be like once a year. Uh, I very rarely, very rare occasion. Uh, there are just so many other things that you can put into your body that are going to help promote health. But also I realize you don't need to have alcohol to have a good time and enjoy other people's company and to be in a social setting. Uh, so if you're in those situations and you feel like I need alcohol for, you know, for these social gatherings, I have to do it. Maybe think about why that is. Uh, and, and um, I think uh, that's a good one. And then what are some of the, I would love to talk about what are some of the easy ways that we can start maybe cleaning up some of these toxins? Okay. You'll notice my nails aren't done. Or maybe you didn't notice my nails aren't done, but that was when I had those high toxin levels. I, I mean, it was like a joke in our family. Don't ask mama to do something Sunday night because she does her nails. I used to do my nails. I would get ready for bed, do my nails, and then lie in bed with my hands on top of the cover so they could dry. And I had all these cool patterns and colors. And then I learned I had all these high levels. So simple things. Don't do your nails because they're basically toxic level up on your beauty products. And what I mean by that is it's tempting to go in your, in your medicine cabinet and literally pull everything out and toss it. Don't do that. It's very expensive. It's stressful. Inevitably, you're going to run out of something. So as you run out, level up. The, my favorite source 
for checking. And by the way, I'm always greenwashed. You know, so I'll be like, oh, this is a cool new product and I'll buy it and forget to look. So don't be me. Remember to look is the environmental working group. They have, you can search by, you can type in the product and it'll give you a rating or you can type in a type of thing and look for a product to buy. So what I would recommend is check your product. Every once in a while, you'll have done a good job and it's a clean product. So in which case, when you're ready to re-up, buy the same thing. But as you start to run out of things is a good time to evaluate it and level up. The um, the thing I got whitewashed, greenwashed about was laundry detergent because it had no scent. So I was happy. It had no dye. I was happy. It came in a cardboard box. So it wasn't plastic. So I was happy. I just missed that the chemicals in, in the pods themselves were pretty toxic. I missed that because I didn't look it up. And so my recommendation is anytime you're psyched about a new product and you're about to buy the deal, just look it up on Environmental Working Group or Think Dirty. Those are the two great sites. So start to remove the toxins from what you're doing. If you're going to buy a bed, buy an organic bed. Don't buy a bed that has flame retardants because you sleep on it for eight hours a day, or at least you're in it for eight hours a day and it's bad for you. If you're going to paint a house or a room or do construction, ventilate properly, use materials that are low to no VOCs, non-toxic, air it out, be mindful of it. Actually think about what you're doing before you do it. There are always better options. And then I think it's important, you know, you talked about alcohol and feeling like we have to drink. It's really important to look at what are the emotional toxins that we're lugging around with us? What incompletions from our past do we have? What ways are we living each day like we were in the past, you know, ruminating, going over it, not forgiving ourselves, not forgiving others. Those thoughts are very toxic. So starting to train our brain to be kind and forgiving. And I'm a tremendous proponent of marriage. So I'm always, if you got into marriage, I'm a proponent for trying to work it out. However, if you can't and your marriage is toxic, I'm a proponent for getting out because it's toxic for you. So I, I always work with my patients on how are you thinking and how are you feeling and how are you living? Because those influence what your gut and your liver and your adrenals are doing. For Let me give you an example. Ed and I were driving in California from Palm Springs to LA. And they had these like 12 foot barriers in the left lane. So these huge cement barriers and Ed loves to drive in the left lane. Okay, fine. He's driving, driving in the left lane. There's a car kind of in front of us in the middle lane. And there's a car, two cars over in the right lane. I happen to see out of the corner of my eye that the car, two cars over starts to swerve. And I'm like, well, the car swerving into the car next to us is going to make that car swerve into front of us. And we can't go anywhere. So I start yelling. I'm like, Ed, break, 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 break. And God love the guy. He does. This is the guy who married me with that room clearing gas. So he's a good guy. Okay. You've met him. He's a nice man. So he's great. He's awesome. So he breaks and sure enough, the car next to us swerves in front of us, but doesn't hit us because we've braked. Nothing happened. Nothing happened. No accident happened here. No animals were harmed in the filming, blah, blah, blah. But for two days, I was like this heart palpitations, jittery, anxious, night sweats. And I'm like, oh man, I got no resilience. I have no elasticity in my band yet because just that almost didn't happen thing threw me off the cliff. So that's the power of a thought. We're going to get in an accident. We didn't get in an accident, but I believed in my heart that we were about to go into the wall. So it's really important to manage your brain because your brain will send you into the wall repeatedly. And that's of all the things you could do to get rid of your toxins. That's probably the most critical is manage your thoughts every day because you have like 60,000 of them. So make them good and retrain them so that they're, instead of saying, I suck at that, or you're so stupid, or you always make that mistake. What could you say that would be nicer? I can't do that yet. I'm trying my best. Sometimes I make mistakes. I'm still trying though. I'm in the game. I did. I I'm working hard. You can always spin it to be nicer to yourself. So start with being nice to yourself every day. No exceptions, by the way. I love that. I love that we like what you've just done is really 
this thing that's a toxin, a lot of times people would think that it's just this tangible thing that you can, you know, put your hands on or touch. You're expanding that. It can be your relationships, your thoughts, not just chemicals and things like that. Uh, and food, we can talk about that in just a minute um, and how important that is. But then you also talked about when you were talking about thoughts, how it's the the self-talk that you have and how you communicate with yourself. One of the things that I really worked on with our kids is they used to say, I can't all the time. I can't do this. I can't do that. I can't climb up high enough into the back of the car or I can't whatever. And I didn't completely, I got them to reframe it to, I don't know how yet. Yet. And yet. Just yet. Yes. Yes. Because that means you can, you just don't know how. Yes. And I always try to get them to, I can do anything. You can do anything. So mm -hmm. I love that you added that in there. Let's talk about food for a minute. Um, yeah. You know, what are the sources of toxins in food? Does it matter? Um, what are some maybe maybe some actionable things people can do when it comes to food also? So in two words, food matters. <laughs> okay. Uh, yes, 100% it matters. This is where it'll make you nuts because you can, unless, there's nowhere on earth where the ground isn't contaminated or there's no pesticides, like everywhere you go, it's contaminated. So this is where it's the do your best, be better, not perfect a, a scenario comes in. So first off, you're never going to be perfect. Have space for it. You're going to screw it up, have space for it. You're going to travel, have space for it. We went to Peru. It was so contaminated in Peru. We figured it would be clean because they're poor. So they don't have any money for pesticides, but it's the opposite. They have to do the pesticides because they can't afford to wait for the crops to do what they do. So mm -hmm. it's pesticides everywhere. So anyway, back to food, wherever possible, eat food that's organic, because if it's not organic, it's been sprayed with most likely glyphosate, which is the world's most common herbicide. It's patented as a as an antibiotic meaning it messes with your microbiome which means your gut is thrown off it throws off the soil it messes up the the microbiome of the soil that messes up the birds habitat it's toxic to bees it's cancer promoting it's classified as a carcinogen by world health organization and if you don't know that it's organic it's most likely got glyphosate on it so wherever possible eat organic and then top sources of of foods that are have toxins in them it, it's a really long list so let's start with strawberries um, kale apples grapes the derivative of those so applesauce grape juice wine dirty little secret it's full of toxins and pesticides so um, i'm very curious actually just as a sort of aside because with all the wildfires in california forests sequester micro mercury. So when they burn, they release all the mercury back into the environment and it's heavy. So it lands on the ground. I'm very curious about whether that's impacting the levels of mercury in food. I think that there's some studies being started on that because we're getting exposed to it. So wherever possible, eat organic, wherever possible, try to eat local. Cause that means it hasn't been schlepped across the country and it's been picked when it's ripest. So meaning it has the highest density of phytonutrients that your body can absorb better. Add in microgreens, organic if possible. When a, when a leaf is born, it has all the nutrients it's ever gonna have. So when it's this big or it's this big, it's got the same nutrients. So if you eat a half a cup of microgreens, you've eaten the equivalent of like a bathtub full of adult greens. So try to go for the baby and the micros because they have more nutrient compared to, so a, a cup of microgreens is more nutrient dense than a cup of grown collard greens or kales. Eat those. They're good for you. But if you have the choice, get the babies into. Don't eat babies, eat baby microgreens, just to be clear. <laughs> okay. Uh, don't eat processed food. When you process food, particularly when you fry it or, or cook it at high temperatures, you degrade the quality of the food and you create pro-cancer forming ingredients in the oils as they break down. That's not good for you. So try not to do that. Wherever possible, minimize your exposure to grains in particular, because 
unless they're organic. And even sometimes when they're organic, they have uh, high levels of glyphosate and other pesticides in them. When you process it, you make it easier to digest. So it turns to sugar faster. Sugar is a toxin unto itself. So by the way, we didn't talk about that talking to me is like the bad news bear. We did not have that conversation. But let's preface, let's pretend we're at the beginning of the conversation and say like, ignorance is bliss, knowledge is power, pick where you flip and, and, and you know, just pretend it's a game. So try to eat organic, slow down and eat so that you digest your food, minimize the processed food. And when you can't get over it and move on, don't make a big deal out of it. Just keep going such good tips. I mean, these are so good. And, you know, if you're thinking about, is it really that important? Do I really need to eat organic? You know what, if it's within your budget, and you can do it, do it. And I, I would always I always think about this too. Would you let someone spray chemicals in your mouth? Like even just a small a bit? Would you let them do that? Probably not. So why would you want to do that indirectly? Spray it on your food, and then you put that food in your mouth. It's the same kind of thing. So if you can go organic, go organic if possible. You also said to shop local. And when you go local, you can go to these local farmers markets and things like that. That's great. I love doing that. Because yeah, the less time it travels, the more nutrients of food's going to be. And, and a lot of times the soil may actually be a little bit better quality too. Mm -hmm. um, but you need to ask those farmers, do you spray? Ask them at the table before you purchase, because especially with things like berries and peaches and all these other things like that, those are highly sprayed, uh, chemically laden fruits a lot of times. So ask ahead of time. And I've been, I've actually been really surprised and shocked when I ask them at our farmer's markets, uh, some of the ones that I wouldn't have even thought they're like, yeah, we spray those, but we don't spray those. So just ask and you're going to get an answer and you're going to know. So, um, thank you so much for sharing those amazing tips. And this has been incredibly helpful. Uh, I know you, you've got your, your book, dirty girl, and you've got some amazing programs that are coming out. Can we talk about, maybe talk about the book a little bit and your programs that are coming out and then where people can find you also. Yep. You bet. The book, the book is the brainchild of me and my husband because I was such a hot, I was, we should have called it hot mess, right? But Dirty Girl is more fun. So tell them, who, tell them about Ed a little bit too. Just a brief intro of who Ed is. Also. Yeah. My, so my husband, my husband was the reason I got into functional medicine because he was the trailblazer and I had never heard of it. So he did his residency. And as he did it, he did a day of functional medicine, his whole residency and shadowed and went into it first. He, so he's a senior functional medicine provider. He does Lyme. He does heavy metals. He does gut. He does autoimmune disease. Um, I do everything too, except I just don't enjoy treating Lyme. So I'm like, go see my husband. He'll treat your Lyme. So I diagnose him and then I send them to him. So we do everything between us. And we have a practice where we do functional medicine with, we have um, five, soon to be six providers and hopefully seven. We have two nutritionists. We do IVs. We're located in New Newton, Mass. And so that's a practice and we're expanding to a second location this year. So that's my husband in the practice. The book is our brainchild. And it's, we wrote our second book, although it's on pause because our, our mentors told us like you got too much going on. So our second book, which is called Sweaty and Bitchy, will be out sometime within the next year to year and a half. And that's all about how to gracefully navigate the perimenopause into menopause and maintain your power, uh, your power, your body, your brain. So, you know, essentially age well, get better every decade. So that'll come out in a year or so. And then it's meant our book is really meant to be part of a the Feel Freaking Amazing series, which is all about living the life you love and loving your life. So this is book one, and it's my story of how do I, how did I learn about the toxins? How did I get rid of the toxins? And how can you do that for yourself? It's really a roadmap to, I think someone said a roadmap out of hell. And I was like, okay, well, maybe not quite so dramatic, but it is a roadmap to go from where you are into greater health and to feel freaking amazing. And that brings me to the Feel Freaking Amazing program, which we have launching soon. It's an eight-week program that combines an elimination eating plan. I don't say the word diet because that implies temporary and you have to die to do it. So I don't like the word diet. 
I like eating programs or eating plans. So it's an elimination program where you eliminate the top allergens and then systematically add them back in to see how you react while you're cleaning up your brain and your toxic thoughts and cleaning out your pantry of the foods that are unhealthy and cleaning up your house from the toxic cleaning products. So it's an eight week program that goes over your whole life essentially. And uh, that'll be launching actually quite soon. By the time people listen to this, it'll be live. And then we uh, we also have a non-toxic, we have chapter one, I'm sorry, we have chapter one for people if they want to say, oh, well, let me see if I like this thing. Chapter one is live on dirtygirldetox.com. So don't go to Dirty Girl, that will not catch what you're looking for. It's Dirty Girl Detox. You can also find the book on Amazon. Again, don't look for Dirty Girl, look for Dirty Girl Trubo or Dirty Girl Detox book. That'll get you in the right area. Otherwise, you're going to go somewhere else that you don't want in your history, just for the record. Um, and then did I tell you everything and how to reach me? It's, um, I'm on all the social at Wendy Trubo MD and my, I'm sure you'll put in the show notes how to spell it. It's different. I changed it when I was 13 just to be different because my friend was Wendy. So I changed my name and, um, I'm on Instagram and Facebook and we have dirty gold detox and our company is five journeys.com. So I'm, I'm everywhere. And we have a podcast that it's uh, the five journeys podcast live like you matter. Love it. <laughs> and I, I'm such a fan of your work and, and I love Ed too. And you both are amazing. I love this conversation. And for everybody listening right now, if you found there were some great nuggets uh, that Wendy shared here, if you found it helpful, be sure to share it with somebody, you know, uh, hit like if you're on the on Instagram or YouTube or wherever, hit like, uh, subscribe to the podcast and the YouTube channel. And then also, if you find these things helpful, it's always great to hear when people leave positive ratings, reviews, and things like that. So please do that. And um, I, I would just say, if you want to find all the resources, show notes, everything that Wendy mentioned here today, you can find all of those over at bonecoach.com forward slash Wendy Trubeau, Dirty Girl. And then we'll have all those resources there, including free access to chapter one of the Dirty Girl book, which was so, so kind of Wendy to do for us. Uh, Wendy, I want to thank you again so much for your time and thank everyone for listening. We'll see you in the next episode. Hey, it's Bone Coach Kevin Ellis. Hope you found that episode helpful and that you enjoyed it. Just one last reminder, if you haven't done so already, head over to bonecoach.com, sign up for your free seven day osteoporosis kickstart. It's going to tell you everything you need to do to start getting on the path to improvement. Hope you found this helpful. I'm your bone coach, Kevin Ellis. I'll see you soon.